Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We know indeed that there are difficult times coming. The prophets inform us of that fact. But it's very interesting what our Lord and Savior taught us concerning when these things begin. In the book of Luke and chapter 21 and verse 28, Messiah encourages us. He says, when you begin to see these things taking place, lift up your head. That is indeed an idiom for encouragement because the time of redemption is at hand. And in this case, the redemption that Messiah was speaking about is the fulfillment, the outcome of what he earned for you and me, for every believer, when he laid down his life. And that is a kingdom, the kingdom of God in its fullness. We need to realize that the transition from this world into the time of the kingdom is going to be a difficult one. One that is going to be experienced by hardships, plagues, famines, earthquakes, wars, all types of things that bring about instability. And what should we be doing at these times? Well, as Tikva does, we share our faith. We tell the people that we know a message, the only message that truly gives hope. But in addition to sharing our faith, telling the good news of Messiah, we also need to be people that contend for the faith. And with that statement, take out your Bible and look with me to the epistle of Jude. Now, you might know that name Jude, but you may not know that that is from a Hebrew name. The name literally is Yehuda or Judah. And that word speaks of praise, praising God, acknowledging him. And that's what the enemy hates. He hates when we worship God in obedience to, and here's the key, to the instructions of God. When we look at the word of God, it is most specific. God gives us instructions. They're called commands. They are not negotiable. They do not have to make your approval. We need to submit, and it's only in that spirit of submissiveness, when we are obedient to the truth of God, then and only then are we in a position to worship God. What we're going to do in this conference, in the first and second sessions, we are going to go through the first half this evening, the second half tomorrow night, and we are going to go word by word through this epistle of Yehuda of Jude. For his message is so relevant for our times. Because we are seeing that sound doctrine people are moving away from. People are confused. People do not understand or know or acknowledge the doctrines of God in order that they might be moved by the Holy Spirit, anointed by him in order to carry out God's work. We need to realize, and this is the first point that Jude's going to make, that we are servants. Let's begin. The epistle of Jude, Yehuda, and the first verse. He writes, Yehuda, and pay very close attention 
to how I translate this. Because oftentimes in English, they in other languages as well, they do not follow the order of the text. And when they change the order and they don't pay attention to the grammatical indicators, what happens is that it loses much of its message. Things become lost in translation. So notice what it literally says and show you how the order that I'm going to be reading is indeed different than probably most of your Bibles. We begin, Yehuda, of Yeshua HaMashiach, that is, of Jesus Christ, a servant. Now, most Bibles will just make it this way, a servant of Jesus Christ, but it doesn't say that. The meaning is the same, but the order shows a greater emphasis on something that Judah wanted to teach us. So he begins, after his name, comes the expression, Yehuda HaMashiach, that is, Jesus the Christ, a servant. And then the next word is the word, but. He's showing something that is different something that is not equal, something that's not the same in his selection. That is when the Holy Spirit inspired him to choose a particular conjunction. He says of Jesus Christ, a servant, but a brother of Yaakov or James in your Bible. Now, why the different order when he speaks about Messiah Yeshua, he puts him first and says that he is a servant. But when he speaks about his brother, he first and foremost mentions the term brother then of Yaakov, of James. Why? He's showing that his relationship, although and according to tradition, this Jude is the half-brother, meaning that both Jude and James... They shared the same mother, Miriam, Mary. But he wants to show that his relationship with, with Yeshua is vastly different than his relationship with his physical brother, and that is James. So he is exalting Yeshua in a very unique way. It's a emphasis to the reader. And then he says, to whom is this epistle addressed? So we read once more, Yehuda, of Messiah Yeshua, a servant, but a brother of Yaakov, of James, to the ones who are called. And this is so significant. Those who have responded to God's call. Not just a call for salvation, but also a call to service in order to commit oneself to the will of God. Now, let me just simply share with you that if you are not committed to the will of God, you are not a disciple. You may have made a decision, a genuine decision for the gospel, but you are in disobedient. Because if you're not committed to the purpose, the will of God, you are not demonstrating discipleship. You are not doing the things for which you have been saved to do. Messiah saves us with a purpose, and we'll see that in a moment. So to the ones who are called in, God the Father. Now, literally it says, Father God. The definite article, the, is not there. So it says simply, Father God, not, the, not God the Father. And what's the implication of that? Well, without the definite article, it shows intimacy. It shows a closeness. It shows a personal connection with God by means of this calling. What one has responded to, and I'm speaking about a covenantal relationship specifically the new covenant. So to those who are called in Father God and, and we have two possibilities. 
If you are following a modern translation, it will speak about those who have been loved. And that means that God has loved them in the past, He loves them presently, and He will go on loving them. But if you see the best manuscript, in fact, if you follow the Texas Receptus by which the King James is translated from, you'll find that it does not say having been loved, but rather having been sanctified. And I believe that that is the best manuscript in regard to this text because we see a relation throughout the scripture between being called and sanctification. Calling is always with a purpose. And sanctification is when one submit to the purposes of God. And it's that submissiveness that brings about a change in our life. When we submit to the purposes of God, the Holy Spirit goes to work in our life in a mighty way. And it's through him that these changes come about. We experience God's equipping we experience his power. We experience his illumination so that we can see things from his perspective. And thereby, we are now ready to serve. So we're called, but we're called according to a purpose. So it says here, having been sanctified, and the second part, and by Yeshua HaMashiach, by Jesus Christ, having been, and pay great attention to this, having been kept or preserved. Now, I like to pay attention to the grammar because through the grammar, we learn things that many times the translators, they are careless. They do not do what they ought to by paying diligence to how the words are constructed, the form. And once again, when it says here that we are kept, being kept by Messiah Yeshua, that word for being kept is in a special construction. It's the perfect. And what does that mean? It means that a time in the past, God, and this is when we have believed, God has kept us. He begins to guard us, preserve us, protect us. However you want to translate this word, it has to do with God's involvement to support us in this world and beyond. So the perfect says that this began in the past when, for a believer, the moment they believed. And then it's still true today, and here's the real emphasis of the perfect tense. It speaks of something in the past, in the present, and extends into the future. When we see the perfect being used about God's activities, it speaks about God's faithfulness, God's commitment to his covenant people. And I find great encouragement in that, that I can be assured that God will not leave me nor forsake me, that the work that Messiah has begun in me because of faith, he is faithful to continue it. And here's what I like and also to finish that work. So there's a great message of hope in this opening verse. Now let's move to, to verse two. The first word here is the word mercy. And let me share with you that, that nothing, and I wanna emphasize that, absolutely nothing is gonna go on in your life from a spiritual standpoint that's pleasing to God until you become a recipient of God's mercy. And let me, let me let you in on a biblical truth. That mercy is just not for some time in the past, but daily. The scripture speaks about mercy by mercy each day. So if you're wise, you're going to be seeking, beseeching God, requesting from God, interceding to him for his mercy to be placed upon you. And, and we could spend a conference that had many, many sessions simply speaking about the mercy of God. Here, Jude makes one point 
of the benefits of experiencing God's mercy. He says, look again at verse 2, mercy to you and peace. And this peace speaks about how God's mercy works with a specific purpose. And that is to bring about, and this is the third, fourth time that I'm going to say this, that God's mercy works in our life to bring about the fulfillment of the will of God, the purposes of God. Any time in the scripture, whether we're speaking it from an Old Testament or a New Testament perspective, any time that you see this term peace, you need to think about the peace that comes as an outcome, as a result from obeying the word and the will of God. And then it ends the this, this second verse with the statement, and love may it be multiplied. Now, some Bibles, here again, are careless. They will speak about mercy and peace and love be multiplied. You cannot translate it this way. In this passage, the word for being multiplied is in the singular. So if it were to relate to all three of these, mercy, peace, and love, it would have to be in the plural. But because it's in the singular, it only relates to the love. And what he's telling us is this. It is only through the mercy of God. It is only when we find ourselves in the will of God, then and then only, is that love, the love of God, going to be multiplied in our life. See, many people are frustrated. They're, they're confused. They are spiritually unaware of what's going on. They do not recognize biblical truth. And the reason for that is because God is not mediating his love into their life because they're in disobedience. What I want to share you with this is when you are experiencing the love of God, it brings about so many positive changes in a person. The love of God is powerful to the extent that John says God is love. Now, is that all he is? No, but one of the major characteristic traits of God is he is love. And it's that love that brings about transformation, the love of God in our life. And we are only going to experience that love. It's only going to be multiplied to us. When we are a recipient of mercy, we are in his will, and obviously we have already had established by means of faith in the gospel a covenantal relationship with God. Now, verse 3. In verse 3, he begins with how so frequently the writers of the new covenant speaks about fellow believers. And that is that we are beloved. Now, what does that speak differently? Well, God loves all people. There's no one that God does not love. But when he says beloved, it speaks about those, and here's the important fact, those who have received the love of God. They are experiencing the love of God through one of the benefits of being in that covenantal relationship. So he's speaking here to serious believers. And that's something that you're going to have to ask yourselves and answer. Are you a serious believer? Are you truly committed to this calling, this purpose of God? Are you someone, as we're going to see in this verse, that are willing to strive, contend for truth and being willing to suffer for it? To stand in opposition to those who are, what the scripture says, false teachers. And realize this, that in the last days, that means in the times of these transitions from this age into the age to come, the kingdom of God, there is going to be an apostasy. People, and we see this today, the beginning of it, people are moving away from simple doctrines to the extent that there's one preacher, very well known, 
And, and he mentioned recently, and this is heresy. He says, it is by faith that one is justified. But faith alone won't get you into the kingdom of God. He says that also works will get you into the kingdom of God. Now, where in the Bible do we find any distinction between those who are justified and those who will be in the kingdom of God? Absolutely no place. What the scripture says is this, having been justified by faith, we become the eternal people of God because faith justifies us and causes us to experience, as the writer of Hebrews says, eternal redemption. So look at this third verse. He says, beloved ones. And now we're seeing how, how Yehuda, Jude, his commitment. He says, I made all effort. Now this word effort is perhaps better translated with the word diligence. He made every act of diligence to do something. And that was, keep reading, to write to you concerning the common salvation. Now, when it says common salvation, it's not using common as it does, for example, if you look at the book of Acts chapter 10, it's talking about things that are common. Those are often that which is rejected. But here, common is used in the sense of a shared it speaks about the salvation which is for all humanity. It is the salvation that is and must be applied to all people if they're going to experience salvation. What it speaks of is a unique and one and only. And what Jude is referring to us is this. There's not many ways that lead into the kingdom of God. That is a false teaching. There is only one way. And that way is only through faith in that gospel message, that work of Messiah, that he poured out his life upon that tree, that cross, in order to pay the price to redeem you and me from all sin. That we might enter into a new covenant, and the new covenant, that word new, relates to the kingdom. So it's a kingdom covenant. And it was ratified, and this idea of ratifying a covenant speaks of giving strength, power, authority to that, that covenant. And what ratified it? The very blood of the Son of God. That speaks about the authority, the power, and the, the ability of that covenant to accomplish what it promises to do no matter what. That covenant will, in fact, be realized in its fullness. Where will it be realized in the fullness? In the kingdom of God. So he writes here how with all diligence, he made all diligence to write to you concerning the common salvation. And he says, and I had necessity, and this is the second time, that he's emphasizing this writing, I had necessity to write to you for a purpose. What was that purpose? To encourage that the people would contend, contend for the faith. Now, I want to pause for a moment and emphasize this. When we look at the book of Jude, one of its primary, its foundational messages to you and me, the followers, the beloved ones, the disciples of Messiah, is that we need to realize, and we're going to see that this speaks about a time of transition, and I believe that we are approaching that if we have not already entered into it. We need to be people, first and foremost, that understand our call to contend for the faith, there is going to be people challenging what the scripture says. And I'm not talking about those outside, but those that are from within. For example, you read 1 John, that epistle, and he speaks about in the last days in light of the work of the Antichrist, that there's going to be those from within the body that are going to go out. And, and John says they go out 
in order to show us, to teach us, to reveal to us that they were never part of us. Did you hear that? Never part of us. There are people in the congregation that you, you fellowship in that are not truly believers. And in, and in the last days, perhaps our days, you are going to see them attacking truth, trying to move people away from it. And what is your call? Just what he says here. Jude is saying, I had great diligence. I had a necessity to write to you. Why? In order that you contend for the faith that once and for all. Now this word, we look at it, apats. And apats usually speaks about something that occurred once and its implications go on and on and on and on. When we speak about Messiah, him being crucified, it speaks about him being crucified one time. But it uses the same word because the, the implications, the outcome, what the cross brings about has eternal implications. And now we're speaking about that same message in the faith. The faith of the death, burial, and resurrection. The faith of the new covenant. And he says here, once, and the implication is once and for all, it has been delivered to the saints, this faith. And what else? Now look at verse 4. This faith which is eternal. It is truth without change. Doesn't matter what culture you're part of. Doesn't matter what nation you are a citizen of. And it certainly does not matter what time period that, that you are reciting. This faith was true 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500, and it will be true forever and ever and ever. And that's why we need to contend for it. And these individuals that are trying to lessen the word of God, trying to unhitch the revelation of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, from the message of the New Testament, you know why they want to do that? Because what we see theologically when we study the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, is there's something that theologians speak about, the, the continuity. What does that mean? It means this, that the primary message, the main truths, the confessions of the faith that we read about, beginning in Genesis, throughout the Torah, those same truths entered into the prophets. And we find them as well in the writings, in other words, throughout the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and the writing, the Old Testament. We find that those same truths, those foundational principles of the Old Testament, they begin in Genesis and they continue. And you know what else? We also find that those same truths these foundational principles enter into the New Testament. And you know what else? They are the primary message. These same truths, these same principles are not just there in the New Testament, but they are the primary message of the New Testament. So what happens is this. There's people that they say, oh, no longer is the Old Testament important. There's no more relevance. We need to unhitch the old from the new. Well, what they're doing is this. When you fail to understand the message of the Old Testament, you cannot understand the message of the New Testament. Now, can you get saved? Obviously. But will you experience that anointing? Will you be led by the Spirit? Will you have the right perspective to serve God and carry out His will? You will not. That's why it's so important that we see that we're dealing with one book that was perfectly inspired by God without any error. And it is proper, the only thing that's proper, for the man of God, the woman of God, to serve God for, and to be ready and equipped for every good work. That's what the Word of God says.
So he says here that we are supposed to contend for the faith that was once and all given to the saints. Now look at verse 4. Here's what he begins to say about those who attack. Verse 4. For there are certain men who have crept in. Now, they've come into the house of God among believers into fellowships. And they've done so, and this word means secretly or in a stealth way, unbeknownst to others what their true objective is. Now, these individuals, they are heretics. And one of the characteristics of heresy is division. When one practice heresy teaches it, his objective is division within God's people. Why? Well, the enemy knows the truths of God. They just don't submit to the truths of God. They know that a house divided will not stand. And we need unity, but here's what's important. Unity based upon the truth. Do not think for a moment that if we just accept falsehood, we all stay together and you believe what you want and I believe what I want and we want to preserve this unity, a unity like that is not worth preserving. We need to be people, as it says here, who contend for the faith because certain individuals have crept in unnoticed, stealthily, And these are the ones that were long ago, previously, written down. That means marked out. They were the ones long ago who were marked out for this judgment. Now, this brings me to another very important truth, and that is there is judgment, and it's coming. When we speak about the transition from this age into the last days, realize the last days, one of the characteristics of the last days is that God's going to begin to pour out judgment and that judgment is going to become more intense and then ultimately that judgment will become God's consuming wrath. And let me just share with you something. If you attend a congregation and the leader there, the primary teacher, does not speak frequently or maybe not at all about God's judgment, God's wrath. I can promise you something. God does not want you to be in that congregation. It's just that simple. Because when we look at the teachings of Messiah, so many, I'm going to say that again, so many of his parables, you cannot study the teachings of Yeshua, of Christ Jesus, and not come in contact over and over and over with him speaking about judgment. Yesterday, I was preparing a message, and in that message, I'm teaching from Matthew chapter, chapter 18, and it speaks about hell fire and eternal fire. Messiah said this, not someone else. He spoke about it. So understand, there is indeed judgment. You cannot preach effectively concerning the cross unless you speak about God's judgment. Because if you were to ask me, where is a good example, perhaps the best example, of God pouring out his judgment, it would be the cross. When God poured out his judgment, on his only begotten son in order that that judgment paid the penalty that should have been upon myself and upon you. Messiah took it. When we set aside the judgment, we are lessening the significance of the cross and not just the significance of the cross, but also the power of the cross. So he says, certain men have crept in, those from long ago that were earmarked, marked out. And they were individuals that were for and will be for the judgment. And who are they? Well, he uses the word ungodly. Now, this word ungodly 
not only speaks about ungodly actions and deeds, but it also speaks about a, a desire not to worship. It's very important that you see that. They're not truly interested in worshiping God as God has commanded that he must be worshiped. Worship. We should not make the heir of many and believe that we have great freedom in worship. No, no, and no. We don't see that in the scripture. We have been set free to worship God in spirit and in truth. Nowhere do we see freedom in regard to how we worship. The freedom is to allow us to worship, but to worship God as his word demands. Worship, which is not rooted in the word of God, in the scriptural admonitions, the instructions, is not worship. And my concern today is that much that's going on today that people believe that they're worshiping God, you know what they're doing? They're just singing songs that they like. They're just doing the things that make them feel good, that get them excited, that get them an emotional experience, a lift up. But see, worship, it should be aimed at God. Remember who the author is. His name is Yehuda. That word means literally to throw praise. It's a term of worship. And Yuda speaks about gratitude. Your worship needs to show gratitude to God. And Yuda, the verb, can also be used for, for throwing or casting something, and here's the key, in a specific direction. And in worship, the direction is to God, for Him, in regard to His purposes not what we enjoy and what we think is, is good worship. So we read here about these who are ungodly. And what do they do? Well, it says, and the grace of our God. The grace of our God they exchange for, and here's the key. They exchange for an ungodliness, a licentiousness, a lewdness, that which is pleasing to the flesh. That's what that word speaks about. That which is sensually, and I'm speaking about the senses, human senses. They behave, they take the grace of God, and they pervert it, they misappropriate it, in order to gratify themselves. And we're going to see how that manifests some of the tendencies of this improper sensual worship, that which glorifies and pleases the senses of human rather than the purposes of God. He writes, not only do they do this, but also the only, and most Bibles will translate in this next section, you'll see the word Lord. And many of them translate the word Lord twice, but understand, it's two different words. And it speaks about that there is God the Father, God the Son. There is the Lord God Almighty, and there is the Lord Messiah Yeshua. Now, now both God the Father and God the Son are God, but it speaks to what we would understand as a reference to the Trinity. And what do they do? Pay very close attention. They are denying. They deny the only, and I would say, master God, ruler God, and our Lord, Messiah Yeshua. And notice, again, this word denying, it's not in the active voice. It's in the passive meaning something causes them to deny it. It is a cognitive. These people are not just misguided, uninformed, they've made a mistake, they haven't understood. No. The fact that this denying is in the passive means something has caused them to, to rebel against the authority, the lordship. 
that, that, that fails to recognize that God is the master. What causes them? This desire for licentiousness, to please their own senses, what they desire. And that ultimately, when we emphasize the flesh, we will deny the authority of God. Look now to verse 6. Now, this is not just uh, unique to human beings, but we're going to see that there's a paradigm for all of God creation. What we see is a dichotomy. There's going to be those who are faithful, those who are unfaithful. And we're going to see in this example that it has to do with where we are located. Are we located where God wants us to be? Or are we going to the places that we want to be? And why do we go to those places? Obviously, to do what we want to do. Now, many people would hear this teaching tonight, and they would say, you know, I, I don't think it's really going to be that popular with people. Nowhere in the scripture, I don't see one of the 613 commandments, be ye popular. It doesn't say that. It says, be ye holy. Holy represents the purposes, the will of God. We need to get away from thinking that, that biblical teaching is to entertain us. It's not. It's to change us. It is, and I need a lot of change, which means this. When I say, God, change me, what I'm really saying is, God, I need your conviction to be placed upon me. I need to be convicted, to be shown, to be marked out for me. Those things are displeasing to you in my life. And if you don't think that there is a, a list of those things concerning you, you are deceived. I've said many times that, that when I really want to experience God, if he seems distant, I'm spiritually frustrated. You know what I pray? I say, God, just like David did, show me those things in my life that's displeasing to you. And when I ask God to show him the things that he's not pleased with in my life, he speaks. And he goes on and on and on. So I can be assured that you and I both need some serious change. And that's what this turbulent time that we're in and it's going to get worse and it's going to get a lot worse. This is just the beginning. So he says here, Giving an example, look if you would to verse 6. And the angels, they did not keep their own domain. That is, they weren't where God wanted them to be. Why weren't they? But, and this means but rather, they left their own habitation. So God has a domain for them. They left that domain and they went from their own habitation where they belonged. And what do we know? Well, they as well are going to experience judgment, the judgment of that great day. And they are going to be in, notice what the scripture says, eternal chains. And these eternal chains are, are there because of, what does it say? They are kept they are enslaved, kept there by these eternal chains. And what are these chains consisting of? Well, it says literally by darkness. Now, this is not the normal Greek word for darkness. Do you know? And this is why it's so important to do biblical word studies. If you ask any Hebrew speaker, what is the word for darkness? They would say hoshech. In Hebrew but but when we look at the plague of darkness there's another word that also appears and what is that afela what's the difference between choshek and afela choshek is simply an absence of light afela is what many Bibles translate as thick darkness and when you go back to the book of Exodus it speaks about how there were individuals that plague of darkness came, and if they were standing, they couldn't sit. If they were sitting, they couldn't stand. They didn't hear anything. It was like they were frozen in thick 
darkness. That darkness kept them in that place. And that's what is experiencing these angels, that they are being kept by this thick darkness. And what does that speak of? The absence of God. Why? God is light. They have no experience with God. Now, that is one dimension of hell, of, of God's eternal damnation, his eternal condemnation. But just don't think it's the absence of God. There's also going to be a physical, spiritual suffering that the Bible speaks of, and I mention it, this, this eternal fire. So these angels, they were kept for that judgment of that great day by these eternal bonds of, of thick darkness. Verse 7. Another example. He says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, who in a similar way to these, what did they do? Well, the next word means to indulge in sexual immorality. Within that word, the root of it is the word porneia, which is where we get the English word pornography. And by the way, pornography expanding in a rapid way. Sexual immorality. Not just do people do it, it's being condoned by many governments. In fact, many of the nations where people are watching this, you have passed laws that, that sanction, approve, support sexual immorality. And we need to be people that speak out against it regardless of what we're called and regardless of the consequences. Now, we, we broadcast throughout the world on television and in many, many different networks. And there's coming a time when more and more networks are going to have to make a decision. And that is whether they submit to censorship and say, you can only broadcast those preachers that don't say anything negative about uh, homosexuality, about same-sex marriage, because that's going to be viewed, if you speak against it, as hate speech. Well, when that happens, I'm off those networks. Because we cannot compromise. We do not make an agreement. And those people who say this, and they'll be the majority, well, for the sake of preaching the gospel, I'll just, I'll just ignore that. I just won't talk about that. Wrong behavior. All that does is to show that you are not a person with any type of fortitude spiritually. We need to realize that if you are, are faithless in the small things, you'll be faithless in the big things. No compromise concerning the truth of God. That's what he means when he says contend for the faith. Don't allow, and people will say, well, what about the outcome of this? The results, that belongs to God. I don't concern myself with the outcome. I concern myself with not turning away from truth. And whatever comes because of that, that's up to God. And if it's in the short term something that's disastrous, God's got all of eternity to, to redeem that and make it into something beautiful. Realize, when we compromise the truth, nothing beautiful will come from that. When I say beautiful, that word can also mean that which is fitting, appropriate, proper in regard to the will of God. When we speak about the will of God, there is an inherent relationship between God's will and his truth. So in speaking about these places, look again, verse 7. Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities are round about in such a similar way of those they engage in sexual immorality. And they turn after, they went after, it says here, different flesh. Now, this word for going after, it's a word of pursuit. Do you realize that the name Yaakov Jacob speaks about going after, pursuing something, pursuing that which is good? These are pursuing something that is not appropriate, that is an other flesh. 
meaning something that is not fitting, something that is not right. Now, this describes Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around about that God, God, what did he do? Well, notice what it says. And he laid this before, meaning he, he gave this to us as an example. He gave this to us as an example of, and here it is, the eternal fire. See, what happens in Sodom and Gomorrah in that region well, we know that, that gofrit, sulfur, fire and brimstone, came down and consumed it. And that's an example of what God says here, just very simply, this eternal fire and his vengeance, that judgment. This is the third time we've seen that phrase, judgment. It says, they are going to suffer. And this word for suffer is a unique one. It means to have over, to be brought under suffering, pain. And this is going to go on forever and ever. In other words, what I want you to see is this. This is serious. What we're studying about tonight challenges us. What direction are we going to go? And it's good that we're challenged now because... Later on, maybe tomorrow, next month, next year, we're going to be challenged for real. We're going to have to bear testimony. Who do we bow the knee to? Is it to the Lord God, the true judge, or to principalities and powers of this world or of the, the other world, meaning that which is under demonic influence? That's what we're going to have to make a decision. Make that decision now. Because if you wait until the times that they are changing, it'll be too late. Today, what does the scripture say? If you hear his voice, respond today. So these individuals, they are going to be, as an example, they have been, as an example to us of this eternal fire and they are going to suffer vengeance or judgment look now to, to verse 8 likewise and and this is i think a most informing scripture because i hear so much about dreams today now did god give dreams yes he did will god in the last days according to joel for example pour out his spirit and and people will have dreams yes they will but the vast majority of dreams that people are, are passing off as, God gave me this dream, it's not of God. And notice here, we're talking about the time of God's judgment. And notice what he says, these aren't my words, this is what the word of God says. And likewise, indeed, that's what it says, this Greek word, mentoi. Likewise, indeed, also those that are dreaming dreams, it says that they defile the flesh. And what else? Well, notice Jude puts two things together. These received dreams, and the source of these dreams were not of God. They were what the Hasidim teach as the, the Sad Acher from the other place. Oh, it's a supernatural place. It's a powerful place, more powerful than the things of this world. But it's not, it is not of God. And these dreamers, oh, they had dreams. And following their dreams caused them to defile their flesh. And what else? They set aside. The word literally is lordship. Probably your Bible probably translates it authority. See, a lot of people, they don't like authority. Why? They want to do what they want to do. They want to make the decisions. That's not spirituality. That is a life of licentiousness, of lewdness, of, of sexual perversion, of pursuing the desires of the flesh. No, spirituality is always, always recognizing godly authority. What do these people do for the sake of for the sake of, of 
defiling their flesh. They set aside authority and the things which are, literally it's the word glorious, could translate it honorable things, those things that are, are right, those things that are connected to the righteousness because there's an inherent relationship between that which is righteous and that which manifests the glory of God. What did they do with these glorious things, these honorable things? They blasphemed them. Now, it's just not that they're uninterested. They blasphemy is a, a word that refers to spiritual warfare. Now, of course, it's saying something negative, but, but words. Now, he's not a theologian, but, but I grew up with Bugs Bunny. And Bugs Bunny would say sometimes, you know, of course, this means war. Why? These words. Same thing spiritually. Blasphemy is a foundation for spiritual confrontation. That's what they're saying. We don't recognize the authority of God and we speak against those things that, that are glorifying him. That's what the word of God is revealing here. Verse 9. Now we're going to have an example of one who does indeed contend for the things of God. Who's that? Look at verse 9. In contrast to these, that's why we have the conjunction of, of dichotomy where it says here, but Michael, that's Michael, the archangel, when with the devil... And there's two words here. With the devil, he, and the two words are synonyms. It means to confront, dispute, and to argue, to speak against. So both of those things. He contended, he argued, he disputed. These two words. He did this with the devil. And why was that? Concerning the body of Moses. But he did not dare to bring, bring judgment and speak blasphemous. Why? See, Michal, he did one thing. He was not there on any personal motivation. He was there out of obedience. He was dispatched to contend for the body of Moses with that enemy, with that diabolical one, literally the devil. And the scripture says he didn't dare to, to, to speak judgment. He didn't dare to, to say something blasphemous about this one, blasphemous judgment. But what did he do? Under the authority of God, that's what, where his power is. He simply says, the Lord rebukes you. That's it. It's not us if we take the spiritual conflict and make it us against them, we will be defeated. We always need to remember that in any spiritual conflict, we are his ambassadors. He has dispatched us. And therefore, it's the Lord's rebuke, not us personally. It's the Lord's rebuke. And if Michael, his name means who is like the Lord. What a wonderful name. If Michael, this archangel, meaning the lead, the head angel, powerful, if the only thing he did in this contention, dispute, arguing, the only thing he did was to say, the Lord rebuke you. And you know what? He was victorious. Verse, verse 9, the second part. Verse 10. But... These, these are those ones who, who crept in secretly to congregations, those who resemble the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, those who contend against the will of God. It says these, on, on one hand, what they do not know, they blaspheme. See, they don't know God, and therefore the things of God, they blaspheme. Now, it's just not to speak evilly. It is a strong word, blasphemy. This has spiritual overtones. So they blaspheme the things, the ones, everything that they don't know. 
But what they know naturally, see, that's their emphasis, the natural. And that's why, and hear this carefully, now, I'm not against science, but, but realize something. Over the years, historically speaking, there's been many things that science said once. The Bible said something different. And in all of those things, the Bible was right. For example, I said this in a message not too long ago. The greatest scientific minds once said this world was round. Isaiah said it's it's not, it's round. So, excuse me, let me say that again. The greatest scientific mind said that the world was flat in the 1500s or so. But Isaiah said that the world was round, and Isaiah was right. There's many things in the scripture that when we understand it, it speaks. For example, in Colossians, scientists will tell you there is some force that holds everything together. They don't know what it is, but there's some. You say, well, gravity, well, where does gravity come from? Well, Colossians says that in Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus Christ, all things were created, they were created for him, and all things consist. That means all things hold together by him. He holds them together. And that's why we need to be people, notice what it says here, the things they do not know, they blaspheme, but what they do understand, what they do understand in a natural way, by nature, as what? As irrational, this illogical beast animals. What do they do with the things they do so-called understand, the natural things? They use them in order to corrupt themselves. Meaning this, they pervert, they misappropriate the things of this world. And anything they touch, get involved with, is for their own corruption. Some Bibles will say destruction. Well, the outcome of corruption ultimately is destruction, but this is the word for, for being corrupt. Now let's look at our last verse, verse 11. It says, woe to them. Now, there are Bible teachers. They would never use that word or phrase, woe to them. They always want to be encouraging. They want to be uplifting. They want people going away feeling good about themselves. They feel that their, their, their service, weekly service, is a time to, to just build people up, make them feel good about themselves. That's not what we always see in the scripture. Sometimes the man of God, the woman of God, has to say, woe to them. And this word woe means how awful it will be eternally unless there's a change. See, Jude is not saying these things hoping that those who are opponents, enemies of his, will just be destroyed. He wants to see a change. Every person who serves God, we serve in order to See people repent, turn away from sin, and embrace the truth of God. Not just that God exists, but that God has truths. You can't embrace God, but reject the truth of God. It's impossible. So Jude says, woe to them. Why? Because the way of, of Cain they, and literally it means, they were led. Here again, we see the passive voice over and over. Why? Very simply, because there's, there's wrong influence that these people are submitting to. They are experiencing the wrong instead of the right. Why? Because they do not embrace the truth of God. Now, now Cain, or Cain, he wanted to offer to God what he wanted to offer. And whenever we worship God our way, we're going to find that it's going to lead us into disaster. So it says that woe to them because the way of Cain, they were led. And the heir of Bilam, that's Balaam, what did they do? 
Well, some Bibles will say that they, they rushed after prophet. That's fine. But do you know that this word for rushed after, however it's translated in your Bible, relates to being poured out. It is related to the word for a libation offering. Now, when you pour something, when you pour a liquid, it, 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 once it starts pouring, it moves fast. And that's why it says rush, but the point is this, that these individuals, because of the wages, the profits of this world, they rushed after it, they poured themselves out, they offered themselves up as an unrighteous libation offering. And this led them to what? It led them to the rebellion of Korach. Now, what was this rebellion of Korach? Against the call of Moses. It's another example of, of refusing to submit to godly authority. They didn't want God's leadership. They wanted to be the leaders. And therefore, what happened to them? Last, last word. And because of these tendency to want what I want, to offer up to God what I think he should have, what I want to give to him, because I am led by, by earthly gain, and because I do not want to submit to God's authority, what happens? It says, they perished. Realize something. Messiah came in order that we might have life and have life abundantly. And there's no way to have life without a salvation experience. And the name Yeshua, Jesus, it relates to salvation. That's why it says that he will save the people from sin. And unless you make a decision, and it's so simple, why would God make it hard? God loves you. And all you have to do is simply to bow your head and to pray with me, God, I confess right now I am a sinner. I do not do your will. I pursue my thoughts, my desires, my plans, my dreams, what I think is my destiny. And God, I ask forgiveness. I want to turn to you. I want to repent from my way and embrace your way that I might know the way, the truth, and the life that is your only begotten Son who died upon that cross to pay the debt, the pun receive the punishment of my sin. And I invite him into my life. I confess him with my mouth. I believe him in my heart that not only he died, but he rose again, signifying this new life, this eternal life that we can have. Father God, we know that your word is true. And for all people who confess their sins and turn in faith and believe in the work of Messiah on that cross for salvation, they will be saved. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your truth. And let me also say that if you're struggling Make this time a time of personal commitment, of renewal, rededication. Make this a time that's pleasing to God. Submit yourself. If you have that desire to submit, God will move. You may not know how to submit. You may not know what to do. That's okay. The Holy Spirit, if you are a believer, you prayed that prayer, you prayed that prayer in the past years ago, decades ago, this can be a day of transformation. Have that spirit that acknowledges your need for God's mercy and submit to God's leadership. Wherever he leads you, you will go. Whatever he calls you to do, you will do. And you're going to know power, intimacy, and, and this is what I like so much, you will know that peace that passes all understanding. You will have a contentment that confuses the world and you will have a joy that's not rooted in your earthly experience. It will be rooted in your eternal covenantal relationship with the living God, the God of Israel. To him be the glory now and forevermore. Amen.
Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.